All right, and we are recording. Welcome everybody to our February 18th JS Core Dev Team Weekly Sync Up. Uh, we're gonna talk about what we've been working on, what we will be working on, and what we are blocked on. And I will go ahead and kick things off. Um, JS Dasta Store. So, released an update to the S3 data store. Um, to make it easier to configure S3 repos before you had to do a bit of configuration, which was kind of annoying. Um, so that is now easier, and the example has been updated in the repo for that. Um, we also added that to the IPFS NPM registry mirror um, that uh, Alex is doing some work on. Um, also got the initial release of pull Implex done. Um, currently working on running that up the chain I've got a work in progress pull request for JSI PFS, tests are passing there. So I'm just working on interop um, test suite right now to make sure everything is good with Go. So hopefully we'll have that um, ready to go this week. Uh, to do migrating some stuff over from Travis. Um, if you are working on the JS side of things and you have projects and you're working on them, make sure to get those migrated over to Travis at your earliest convenience. You can follow along with the IPFS Azure uh, ticket number to see what's going on there um, and see what stuff's already been worked on. Uh, da -da -da. Also released a fix for the PDP circuit where the source and the destination peer validation wasn't really happening. Um, so that should be improved now. So if you have any issues, let me know. Um, this week, I'm gonna finish up the pull Implex release for JSI PFS, and then um, I will likely look at working on the listen, announce, no announce address lists for libp2b configuration. Um, you can see the issue in there. Um, Go has the ability already to, for IPFS to be able to specify your actual listen addresses, which is super convenient if you're running inside like a Docker container or an EC2 instance and you want to run behind an ELB, you can actually specify that you're listening or you can announce on the ELB even though you're not technically listening on it, which is super helpful. So we've been running into some issues with that and we'll need it for the libp2b testing environments. So I will probably work on that and then work on getting that integrated with JS IPFS. So that is compatible with go. Does anybody have any questions for me? No. All right. Next up, Alan. What? Found it. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you. Um, uh, I'm here. Uh, I didn't mean to be here, but I got my dates wrong. Anyway, uh, I, <laughs> I'm, uh, what have I done? I uh, the oh okay. First of all, uh, Travis, uh, sorry, Jenkins went away rather abruptly, uh, and we switched to Travis, um, and so I did a quick pull request to do that for the HTTP client. Um, then I updated a couple of examples for the HTTP client because they're really out of date and I didn't realize. Um, and uh, I think that was part of something else I was doing, but I just noticed it. Uh, oh, I, it, was, it was the stuff that I was working on last week. You know how if I put it in the test profile, um, I, I think I, I can't remember what I, what I did, but anyway, I found out they were out of date, so I, I, uh, I fixed them up. Um, Okay, so uh, we renamed the HTTP client module um, a while ago now, and uh, we took a snapshot of the um, people who um, who were currently depending on it. Um, and uh, at the moment, there's still a whole bunch of people who are depending on the old version. So I made a little script to grab, to take that data, that snapshot data, and turn it into a bunch of like um, maintainers, GitHub usernames, who we consider to, be the maintainer because um, so we get repos, um, but they are not. You can't just grab the um, or, um, the the GitHub username out of them always because sometimes they're an org, uh, and so uh, what the script does is it if it if it's a GitHub user then that's cool. They're probably the maintainer for that particular package. Um, but if they are if it's an org, it looks at the um, contribution stats for that particular repo and sees who's done the most commits and uh, they're probably the maintainer um, as per that script. But if anyone has any other suggestions on that, then I am open to 
uh, who were open to hearing them because uh, that was just a metric I made up. Um, and uh, so yeah, we can. We've now got a list of people who we should probably ping or send a pull request to. But the important thing is we know who they are and we know what repo it is that currently depends on it. And it, it takes out all of the ones that have updated since the snapshot was taken. So um, so it's all good. Um, cool. Uh, what was I doing? Debugging an issue with JS IPFS nodes not being able to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a real. Uh, big blocker at the moment. Um, JS IPFS nodes currently can't get content from other JS IPFS nodes or any other I IPFS nodes for that matter. Um, the something's something's changed, and it looks to me as though um, the like bit swap in uh, on the on the Go IPFS nodes that are operating as the preload nodes um, is currently not sending back um, things or blocks that it has. Uh, even like, because what JS IPFS does is it sends an API recall to refs to say uh, refs with this particular CID and then the Go IPFS node will respond and say, yep, got it. Um, but then we rely on the WebSocket connection mm -hmm. and BitSwap to actually transfer that information um, between the nodes. Um, and what I'm seeing is that that connection is open and um, I see uh, us communicating our want list um, and I see the preload node um, communicating its want list to us, um, but I don't see any uh, blocks coming in. And so that seems to be the issue uh, because we're not getting things that we ask for even though they are on the preload node. So something's changed and I opened an issue for it. Anyway, so that took a while to uh, debug and well, I haven't really debugged it. I've just found out <laughs> what the problem seems to be. Um, so anyway, I think that needs some Go people, some help from the Go people. Um, that aside, uh, I started I started work on a um, uh, on Mplexit, uh, which is a kind of async iterators um, implementation of Mplex um, uh, because pull. Mplex exists now. This is way easier because it's way easier to look at the pull Mplex code and, and figure out what's going on. Um, but yeah, so I just made a quick start it on it over the weekend actually, and um, it's currently uh, so it currently uses VL to avoid unnecessary buffer concats, um, which is good because concatting buffers together takes a long time. Um, and uh, I did an experiment uh, using so varint. We use that quite a lot to um, to 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 encode and decode things, but it needs a it meant it's meant to be to be given a buffer, but um, I'm giving it a BL instead, uh, and I'm using a proxy to um, to get the so it, like varint only asks like for the length property and like uh, the uh, square bracket kind of zero one like the bytes of the particular buffer, and BL exposes a method called get which allows you to get bytes at an index. So um, we use a proxy to get particular bytes out of BL, um, which is kind of fun. Um, but I figured that might be faster than uh, concatting things, but I don't know. Um, but it's just a fun experiment. Uh, and it works, which is rad. Because um, uh, I have now got a uh, encoder and decoder, um, like a pull based encoder and decoder. And I've taken the pull mplex um, tests and they, and kind of, uh, rejig them a little bit, but they pass for um, for this. And the encoder and decoder is basically um, take is like the end end parts of the, uh, the the when the data comes in and when it goes back out to the uh, connection. So the, that's kind of step one, I guess. Um, so yeah, and then I was eventually, I guess, going to build it as this kind of uh, async iterator thing, um, but put like a, a kind of pull stream facade on it so that it can just be put in and we can do like benchmarks or um, or just switch it out really easily. Um, but that is a way away. Um, but yeah, uh, just to say I started work on it. Um, okay, that was really long, sorry. Uh, I'm blocked on that bit swap thing I was talking about um, and I am not in on Wednesday or Thursday this week. So um, I've literally got tomorrow to do more work. So I'm either be doing more work on MPEXIT or um, the COD V1 Base32 work. So that's me. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Well, 
All right, awesome. Thanks, Alan. Uh, next, Volker. So I mostly spend my time in the IPLD world, um, but the interesting bits for people also in this meeting is I've created a tool called DAG Builder, which is you describe your DAG in a text file and then it creates then the, the DAG for you and does the linking and hashing and the links match with the hashes and so on. So yeah. Um, so if we ever need to experiment with some DAG stuff, that might be useful. Um, then I've also created a tool to get a graph with visualization out of your DAG because it's also what I needed for debugging. It's pretty simple. And then I work on the, so my main work is on the IPHD selectors stuff, which I've created a repository, so that's really work in progress. But if anyone wants to check out what's going on there, I can just check it out and see what crazy things we're doing. And I'm not blocked, and hopefully next week, I'm not fully into the selector stuff, so I can finally um, uh, get this uh, JS IPLD um, API uh, change merged, hopefully. Um, yeah, that's the plan. That's all. Alex, did you have a question? Uh, I was going to try and answer it myself. Didn't Michael write a tool to do something really similar to just generate arbitrary DAGs from things? I seem to remember him mentioning it a while ago. I guess like almost everyone did, like everyone working on IPLD did some random thing. So, <laughs> and I hope that, yeah. Um, so there's also a graph builder thing, but it also didn't really work for me. So anyway, yeah, so it's, I hope that deck builder will be the thing. Um, I don't know, we'll see. Now we have 17 standards. Yes, exactly. Uh, but one of those is mine. <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, oh, under what circumstances would I have my DAG in a text file, and how 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 does it get there? Yeah. So basically, <laughs> yes. So the idea is that um, Ellen, as you were building the uh, uh, Explorer, for example, the IPLD Explorer, you probably had the problem of you don't have a DAG to test it on. Um, so the idea is not really, ba so basically it's currently it's a one-way thing. So it's not that you create a text file out of your DAG, but it's really you do some testing and you need some weird shaped DAG somehow. And before you basically put in those C uh, things manually, then copy and paste the CIDs so you link them properly and so on, and you can just put them in a, in a file, the structure, and then it will figure out the CIDs automatically and the linking and everything, and you don't have to care about it basically. That's the idea. I see. So it's for testing or playing around. I get it. Okay. Um, and my second question, graph biz, how does that differ from um, the, like the, you know, in the IPLD Explorer in the one that's in the web UI? Does that, how does that differ from what's in that one? It works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, honestly, so no, there's so the problem with me, like in the, in the web UI stuff, it somehow didn't always work for me that well. And also, if you really want to see the full graph, so in the iPad Explorer, you can click through things, but if you really want to have a bigger one, you want to see the full shape, for example, then um, you can use uh, the graph with thing. But it's really a super simple script just to yeah, get an idea of the data. And also what it does is, so you um, write a function which then tells you which properties to use as a name for the node, so you really get a structure of a thing without all the properties and everything. Um, but again, it was more just like a quick hack, and I think that might be useful to someone else, so I just published it, but it's not really like a properly supported tool. <laughs> what is it? Uh, oh, graph is, it's, it's HTML, right? It's No, it's, it's a graph with file, so it's like a custom format thing. Oh. So it's a text file. So it's like a ASCII, ASCII graph language thing. Okay. The output, and then you use the graph this tool to visualize it. So, so it was just creating the the graph this text file out of an IPLD DAG. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. Next up, Vashko. Hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, I got some progress on the little interrupt during the last days. 
Uh, most importantly, uh, I shipped today the Lip2P Go dependency, which is in uh, the npm Go Lip2P dep uh, repo. It has support for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows binaries. Then uh, I also got ready today to uh, interrupt uh, test setup and uh, connect uh, um, pull request. Then the Jacob will soon uh, review. And then I got some uh, fixes or improvements in uh, both uh, JS lip 2 daemon and the uh, JS lip 2 daemon client for making everything uh, uh, work in the interrupt side. Uh, then I also got the uh, lip 2 gossip sub initial implementation reviewed. I, I provided a lot of feedback to my career. She, I saw that she uh, had some uh, movements in the PR. I have not checked, but maybe she already fixed everything that I uh, reported, but I will try to have another look this week. Then uh, uh, there was a, a problem with uh, the defaults for the lip 2 config and the DHT was not being uh, disabled in browser. Now I have also a PR for that. Uh, and uh, for this week, I want to uh, debug the CPU usage uh, really high in uh, GSIPFS. I, I started looking at it uh, uh, last week. And basically, I think the problem is when uh, uh, the republish of IPNS puts data to the DHT but uh, I need to uh, go deeper in the code base in order to understand why. And I will do this this, this week. Then uh, I also want to migrate to all the repos, uh, which I'm the lead maintainer to use Travis CI and uh, hopefully uh, start adding uh, DHT interrupt tests and uh, also add PubSub support for the daemon client and uh, the daemon that we currently do not have. Uh, one final note, I will not be available on uh, Thursday afternoon and uh, on Friday as well. So if you guys need anything from me, uh, just ping me before that. And that's it for me, any questions? Awesome, thanks Vasco. Next up, Hugo. Hey guys, so last week we spent all of the week in London with the London crew was great. Really fun times, a lot of work got done. Uh, most of it was uh, related to the move to Travis, fixing problems with some repos that are more problematic, like the, the P2P and JSIPFS repo. Uh, almost all of it got solved. We are only missing the Windows uh, problem in LimpHP. Mm, hopefully, uh, that will not be on our side. And it's something that the Windows machine from Travels is missing. We will get that sorted out as soon as we can. Uh, if you want to help out moving all the repos to Travis, you can check the link I put there. Um, also did some work on integrating the benchmarks into the new Travis setup. The, this is uh, for now only for the JS IPFS repo. Uh, we got into some, some issues. Uh, the near form guys that did all the old benchmark stuff um, managed to solve, solve some of them. So now I probably uh, I'll probably be able to finish the integration and finish the dashboard, so we get some nice uh, comparison between the performance from uh, pull request and master. Um, also, we did a lot of uh, conversations with the info team about. Um, the benchmark setup, the machines, uh, how we deploy stuff, uh, the preloaders, bootstrappers, making JSIPFS binaries so it's easier for the info team to deploy um, our stuff to the to the to their uh, infrastructure, um, and some actions got out of it. And we will uh, follow up in the uh, next couple of weeks on that. And this week, 
I'm hoping to finish the bundle size PRs, doing the bundle size integration to basically add an extra check to at least some of the repos. Um, so we make sure that we don't like uh, increase the bundle size by mistake by just like changing a simple PR uh, require and add uh, uh, size to the bundle size. Um, and also finish the benchmarks now that the, the API bug is fixed. So that's basically it. Anyone has any questions for me? Idle. Uh, like a quick question regarding uh, move to Travis. Should we allow Windows uh, target uh, to fail? There's like an option to mark entire build as green, even if a specific uh, sub build fails. So um, it depends on your needs. If by default we should hope that the Windows, um, the window, the tests running in Windows will pass. Uh, for now, we are only getting problems on libp2p, but more stuff can come up because the Windows um, VMs on Travis are still in beta. So yeah, if you run into problems, either ping me first so to see if we can fix them because some of some stuff is already in the link I, I put there. Some stuff we already know that uh, Windows like breaks and we need uh, we have some workarounds for it, but new other stuff can come can come up and either we allow it to fail in the meantime, or we try to, f to find uh, a way to fix it. Uh, Aaron from the Infra team has a, a contact there on the Travis team. We, we have been having some discussions about some stuff, so we can, uh, it's good to have some feedback about it, so we can tell them that stuff breaks and why. Okay. Alan. Can we, I know in GitLab, there was an option to allow a build to fail. Can we, is, does that exist for Travis or no? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so we could just add it to the Tra Travis config, right? Yeah, uh, uh, I'll uh, add um, the config or the YAML uh, block uh, to, the, to this issue on Azure. So people that, uh, People that find problems with Windows know how to add the allow failure option to their Travis config. Or probably just to the readme where the, the instructions to add Travis are. One of those uh, spots out that uh, documentation. Any other questions for Google? All right, next up, Zane. Oh, not much to say. Uh, I was out of pocket uh, this past week. And this upcoming week, going to tackle the data store FS PR and address any PR comments on the JSI PFS repo. That's it. Oh, any questions for Zane? Just Alan. to say, uh, I have a review in a tab that I haven't submitted yet. Awesome. <laughs> it, it, it's coming. All right, next up, Alex. Hello. Uh, right, so this week, the week just gone, what have I been doing? Right, so the first thing was I investigated a memory leak because um, everything seemed to be filling up on MPI and IPFS. Um, and it would fall over after like sort of half an hour. Turns out there wasn't a memory leak. Good, like great news. Uh, what was happening was um, writing all the stuff to S3 was taking too long. And so the pull stream was kind of like the, it was, it was downloading all the stuff from NPM uh, and then having nowhere to send it. So everything was just buffering up in memory and eventually the process fell over. 
Um, so I just got it to, like, I just tuned it a bit and got it to be less aggressive with its downloading and that, all that problem went away. So that is cool, really good news. Uh, a few minor PRs, um, started doing the Travis migration for Unix FS MFS, uh, written a blog post all about uh, the NPM on IPFS registry and added some monitoring to it as well, which is great. Um, so we kind of see, see what's going on inside there. Uh, not blocked in anything. Um, yeah, so I'm going to finish off the Travis stuff. And the other thing I've noticed is really weird. Uh, I asked, I spoke to um, Jacob and Vasco about it at the end of last week. Um, was that it seems that the, P, the uh, pub sub uh, doesn't work for more than an hour on IPM on, on NPM on IPFS, which is really weird. Um, so I created a, um, you know, just a little replica of it, and I haven't been able to replicate the problem. Uh, and I don't really know how to debug it either. Um, so I really appreciate a bit of help on that. Uh, Going to open an issue so that we can talk about it. But yeah, very weird. Um, that is going to be me. So I'm away from Wednesday uh, and all next week. And I'm back the week following. Um, it is it. Any questions? No. All right. We have a couple new folks. Oh, Alan. Sorry. Um, can I get, can we get a link to the, uh, the, not the, the, the not memory leak that you fixed? A link? Yeah. So the, you said there was a problem with data, the data store instead? No, there wasn't a problem with the data store. The problem was that it was pulling down stuff from NPM too quickly. Oh. And it was it wasn't writing to to S3 fast enough, so everything was getting buffered in memory. Oh, okay, I misunderstood. Sorry. Yeah, because so we use a pull through as part of um, part of our pull stream, and that you know keeps just queuing more stuff, and that queue is what is running out, what is eating up all the memory. Cool. Okay. Uh, Jim or Avik, do either of you have an update or have any questions? Um, I don't really have much of an update, but uh, I'm in Portland this week, so I'm going to hang out with uh, Arakli of Gazala, and he's doing this cool thing called Lunet. So he's integrated JS IPFS into it. So I'm going to maybe do some experimenting with that this week. No updates on this end either, but hopefully we'll be getting things together and getting more into the space in general. So it was very helpful to sort of write out the kinds of problems you guys were having and learn about them. Cool. All right. If nobody has anything else, we are right at time. So punctual. And uh, everybody have a awesome week and awesome time off for anybody who's taken that off. And we will see you all next Monday. Bye, everyone. Bye.